Good evening, everybody. I just want to say thank you to the conference organizers and a shout out to my Pacific Studies Working Group because I see a lot of faces here and really appreciate the feedback, love, and encouragement that y'all have given me. Um, it really makes a difference. So I appreciate you all. My name is Olivia Contenisa, and um, thank you so much for staying all day to listen to us. The diverse water cultures of the Pacific region include everything from freshwater aquifers to coastal ecosystems, to shallow waters and reefs, to deeper waters, the seabed, and all of that life that lives in between. Pacific Islanders have long fought for the things that matter to us most, like water and reciprocal relationships with our natural resources and environment. Indigenous Pacific Islanders relationship with the sea has notably been recalibrated by colonialism, capitalism, and militarism, and sea level rise is just one consequence of these systems. In similar ways that Hawaiian Islands, the Marianas and the Marshall Islands, and waters have all been targeted for exploitation and military occupation, our coral reefs and seafloor ecosystems have also always been targeted. Volcanic eruptions millions of years ago formed the southern and northern parts of Guahan, part of the Northern Marianas Island chain. And once that volcanic activity stopped, coral reefs grew in shallow waters around the volcanic peaks. Gradually, the corals and other hard-bodied marine organisms deposited calcium carbonate skeletons along with other things, which accumulated, extending the reefs around the island cycles of reef building and uplifting formed the northern plateau of Guahan, as well as the high cliffs on the eastern coast. Reef history and cultural dynamics of coral reefs are often obscured by the interesting dichotomy in which coral reefs are produced as this exotic destination, and the figure of the reef is simultaneously produced as an exploitable ecosystem, but not marked for protection. Now and always, we can't talk about Pacific vulnerabilities without talking about coral reefs. And we especially can't talk about Pacific resiliency without talking about coral reef. And we can easily lose scope of how our organisms and ecosystems are very much interconnected. I wanna to highlight today how Pacific Islanders are centering their own interventions by rewriting narratives of environmental impact through a lens of coral in the deep sea that pivots on resiliency and regeneration across time and space. Past and current military plans for the island of Guahan, my ancestral homeland, have included dredging, drilling, and destroying live and limestone reef. And what I learned from my friend Elizabeth um, is that that really effectively destroys living archives uh, of evolutionary history and data of the reef that scientists can use today and planners can use today to plan for our changing climate and our conditions. So not giving up hope, but we can use that data if it's not destroyed. The U.S. Department of Defense is currently acting on construction plans of a live firing range in the sacred place of Latexan which will further deforest the jungle, contaminate water sources, destroy cultural artifacts, destroy a thousand acres of limestone forest, habitat for numerous endangered species, and poison the land. So today I'll be taking you through two examples, one in Guahan and uh, Papua New Guinea, to give you some clarity of where we're at. Military industries in the, in the Pacific have structured and fragmented communities but really importantly, they've also created new inter-island connections and mobilizations. Military colonialism deals with land in specific ways, occupying land for the sole purpose of military use, building bases, testing weapons, and using indigenous lands as training playgrounds and toxic dump sites, as a lot of folks have outlined today. This logic has made it possible for the dredging of whole and healthy coral reef to make hard land for military complexes, um, aircraft runways, and naval passages. We also use coral reef to scan for signs of the, of the future. So like Pacific people, coral has the ability to span multiple environments in different spaces, 
to thrive and importantly to recover, even in the most harsh and violent conditions, even when the odds are against them. In response to such grim coral reef forecasts from bleaching, acidification, overfishing, dredging, and land-based pollution, to name a few, there has also been an increase in coral reefs as one of the frames and organizing principles in which Pacific Islanders engage self-determination, demilitarization, and environmental issues. They increasingly cite past and ongoing damage to coral, as well as projected calculations from the scientific community of anticipated harm and societal impact. I employed the term coral reef climate justice as a frame to historicize and theorize coral reef change related advocacy and action on behalf of coral reefs as an ethical, political, and social justice issue with direct consequences that greatly impact our planetary functioning. And I think that specificity is important. We are witnessing what happens when centuries of colonization, militarization, and environmental injustice collide with decades of globalization, natural resource <laughs> extraction, and climate change. So increasingly high-level climate policy narratives attempt to legitimize problematic colonial and military interventions, and they undermine ongoing fights for indigenous Pacific Island struggles for self-determination, sovereignty, and redress for decades of environmental injustice already. Today, I wanna to bring our attention to one of the ways that indigenous critiques and visions for the future manifest. My own research focuses on indigenous Pacific Islanders, analysis and legal challenges to environmental impact statements, or EIS as I might refer to today, and the, their use or disuse by the United States military. Environmental assessments in any shape or form are important sites for the study of the intersections of class, law, culture, society, ideology, empire, and so much more. In Guahan, uh, our communities are fighting the continual displacement of indigenous peoples from ancestral lands and the contamination of water, and environmental impact assessments have been a critical site in their struggle. So this chart is just giving you a general flow of how environmental impact statement processes work, and there's also a usually an online public comment process, which is very interesting to read, and I'll talk about more in my dissertation. And so in Guahan, we're about in the draft stage in public review. The toxic blend of military agenda mixed with climate and environmental policy in Guahan continues to situate indigenous Chamorros as second-class citizens. These realities can all be tied to the lack of political leverage we have in our status as an unincorporated territory of the US as a colony. In many ways, Chamorros are using speculative design to assert indigenous futures and sustainable environmental planning into policy, making critiques to the environmental assessments as their assertion of what they want and their vision of the future. Protect the Texan is a direct action group dedicated to the protection of natural and cultural resources in all sites identified for Department of Defense live fire training on Guahan. They argue the construction constitutes an environmental injustice to the indigenous people of Guahan and further disempowers native communities through militarization and contamination of native lands. One of the areas they aim to protect is the Texan, which means to stir or the stirring place and is probably in reference to the stirring or churning waters nearby. The Texan is an archaeologically important and sacred area that contains an abundance of cultural resources, including lati stones, water wells, limestone mortars, cave drawings, potteries, and shell artifacts. Our indigenous peoples verse themselves in military language, colonial tactics, and environmental policy in order to challenge and rewrite narratives that are presented in environmental impact statements that attempt to ignore and erase true environmental impact and the interconnected nature of our ecosystems in order to push through development plans no matter the cost. For Latexan in particular, community groups have used aerial footage 
and the Department of Defense's own maps to prove they are continuing to clear land despite agreed upon pauses in construction. Give a second to look at their signs at a recent protest. And interestingly enough, when the recent um, Trump holds on certain military development projects uh, came about, um, this firing range came up as one of the ones that was put on pause. So the folks in Guahan are conflicted, right? Because at one end, they're getting a pause to construction, but at the expense of another community, right? So that's not really justice. Now shifting to deeper waters and different elevation, shared concern about decolonizing Pacific ecosystems in Guahan through a lens of underwater worlds led me to interrogate the rapid developments being ushered in through the projected billion dollar global deep sea mining industry or DSM that is already underway. The Pacific is a region of immense deep sea mining potential. New technological developments and camera systems that can withstand the pressure of the deep sea and robotic vehicles are documenting that the deep sea once thought to some to be remote and void of life is actually beaming with so much life that we really don't know all that exists in the new species that they're finding every day. As this new industry charts our deep sea and deep coral ecosystems for mineral extraction, dredging, and blowing up thousand year old hydrothermal vents, it is literally charting new rules and regulations with irreversible and unsteady consequences. The deep sea mining industry is after silver, gold, copper, manganese, cobalt, and zinc that fuel many of our electronics and electric eco-friendly vehicles and technologies. The excavations and underwater destruction caused by sediment plumes, discharge of tailings and wastes, and altering natural processes of deep water carbon sequestration asserts a disregard for non-human life on the seafloor and a disregard for the unstudied consequences of altering the biodiversity of these rich and unique ecosystems. It looks kind of familiar of a landmine, yeah? Deep sea mining, the deep sea mining industry has heralded the volcanic rock it can extract from the deep sea as the future because they argue it unlocks the secret to satisfying the growing demand for metals used in batteries and clean energy technologies and ultimately towards a low carbon future away from fossil fuels. Deep sea mining highlights new concerns for island nations rights in international waters by limiting the power of island nations to allow control and monitor deep sea operations and to declare no mine zones to say they don't want mining. Chamara lawyer and activist Julian Uggen, my hero of Ocean Blue Law, argues deep sea mining is a contemporary form of invasion that shares many features of past resource scrambles, including a general disregard for environmental and societal impacts and marginalization of indigenous peoples and their rights. This can be attributed in part to deep sea mining's original 1960s common heritage framing based on a limited technical study of the seabed at the time that presented this fantastical portrayal of almost inexhaustible mineral resources to the first committee of the United Nations General Assembly in 1967. This initial exploitation framing has continued to dominate deep sea narratives and create this narrative of, of unlimited exploitable resources. In 2011, the South Pacific Island of Papua New Guinea granted the first deep sea mining lease to the Canadian company Nautilus Minerals Inc who rushed in to secure licenses for seabed exploration. The deep sea potential created pressure for the people of the Bismarck Sea of Papua New Guinea to protect their sea floors and ocean ecosystems. After aggressively seeking funding for its flagship Salwara One project set to begin this year, Nautilus ran into financial troubles and failed to make payment on its ship and filed for bankruptcy. Many critics of deep sea mining, including the Alliance of Salwara Warriors, shown in the picture, have praised their financial fall, stating they're glad Nautilus went bankrupt before they could bankrupt the sea. 
The ship in question was then sold to an Indian firm, EDL Energy, and is also planning to engage in deep sea mining explorations on behalf of the Indian government. Deep Green, a new deep sea mining venture, is exploring mining possibilities off the shores of Nauru, a nearby Pacific island with its own tragic history of phosphate mining and controversial refugee detention centers. Deep Green is slated to be the new pioneer of deep sea mining in the South Pacific. Deep sea mining is currently really expensive and those against it hope to institutionalize regulations before it becomes more affordable. Before being granted their license, Nautilus commissioned environmental impact studies that argued their project would be less destructive than land-based mining and would support a low carbon future. Opponents to the project argued those EIS statements were biased, misleading, and they warned that there would be but this is a major project experimenting with unknown technologies and unknown consequences that we might not be able to take back. The key argument for Uggen's team at Blue Ocean Law is that Nautilus did not give PNG residents and its indigenous people free, prior, and informed consent about the project, leaving them with no control. Because the health of our ecosystems is closely linked to our own survival, I see the crux of decolonizing the future of our ecosystems as dependent on how deep sea mining legislation incorporates or doesn't incorporate protections for international indigenous rights and the depth of indigenous engagement within these industry conversations. Thanks to the generous grant from the UC Speculative Futures Collective, I will further study the so-called gold rush for seabed minerals especially as 29 new seafloor exploration licenses have been granted worldwide. Using coral in the deep sea as an optic allows us to form new connections and provide different ways of looking that we would miss otherwise. This frame recognizes nature and Pacific people's capacity for regeneration under the right circumstances. And in closing as a provocation, what past and future modes of resistance might emerge if we understand our struggles and our futures as being connected by coral. How does coral, coral remember, resist and regenerate alongside legacies of colonialism, militarism, and increasing energy demands? How do Pacific connections look and feel different if we can understand our stories and inter-island connections through coral and the deep sea? Thank you.